to see you all today, and we give you a real welcome in the name of the Lord. Looking down and seeing the church so full, yeah. I think it's great. Then I'm thinking, I think it's not so great. <laughs> <laughs> With all these regulations, no one will It's great to see us all social distancing and looking so well today. And again, as always, we're very conscious of the people that are even watching online today, and we give them uh, a real warm welcome in the name of the Lord. And even folks that are in their own homes, there could be issues, there could be problems, there could be concerns, and we're here to think about the families um, that that aren't here, but are very much with us um, through the online ministry. I was just listening to Dr. David Jeremiah the other day, and he said, you know, when I started off in my ministry over 50 years ago, he says, I preached a small crowds. He says, I never realized for three months I would come to a point where I would preach to a completely empty crowd and to no church whatsoever. Um, he says, yet, he says, the millions of people that are watching online um, that have just become very much a part of the family. You know, that's, that's, that's the way the online ministry has, has developed. And so we're very, very grateful for the folks that are watching and also for all the folks that are here today. Good to see the family of God together. And we're all here to worship and we're here to praise the Lord. So we're going to stand together and we're going to sing a lovely song, Come People of the Risen King. Now you can't sing this song without a smile on your face. I'm looking really happy and singing joyfully. So all that's trying to keep it toned down. I don't know how you're going to manage it. But anyway, let's stand and sing, Come People of the Risen King. Sing. 
to start our service today, isn't it? Just to rejoice in the Lord. You know, I woke up this morning with a verse in my mind on my heart. Psalm 116, verse 8. And this is what it says. For you have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. What a powerful voice to wake, or verse to waken up to, isn't it? Amen. You know, our soul being delivered from death, our eyes from tears, and our feet from falling, just to walk before the Lord in the land of the living. And so, let the word of God really be your encouragement. And let's rejoice today. You know, in the midst of all the bad news and stuff that's going on around us, we can rejoice and give thanks to the Lord, can't we? Amen. You know, even this morning, giving God thanks for the food that we have eaten, the clothes that we wear, being able to come in here and worship together, and uh, so much to give God thanks for. And that's why we're going to praise my soul, the King of Heaven. Amen. Lovely old hymn. Come on, let's stand and sing it <coughs> unto the Lord. Worship the Lord in the major key as well as in the minor key. Um, as we were getting ready to come to church this morning, got a phone call from Eddie Young. Eddie has informed me that his brother-in-law, some of the folks would remember Robert Crosby. Robert passed away yesterday and so we're thinking of Maureen and all of the family um, that God will draw near and comfort them at this time. And so just thinking about the Crosby family, they've been um, a great supporter of the welcome work over all of these years, members of Monkstown Baptist Church, and but very much interested in the work of God here. And it's not the first letter, it's not the first phone call that we have received from that family, just encouraging us and just wanting to be a help to the work. And so we don't forget that. And so we remember the Crosby family today. Um, 
also thinking of others that um, yesterday we um, got a, a message to pray for a lady who, who is ill at this time and so we're going to just remember this lady uh, before the Lord um, as I look down in the body of the church and know that you know even within ourselves there's needs there's cares there's problems there's family members and we're thinking of, of family members that have been on our hearts today that we're praying for and I'm thinking of Jim and so we're just going to remember Jim as well Maureen and and others that are that just need our help thinking of Gloria's brother Billy and just folks that that need God's help at this time and so um, listen if you've come today and if there's a real burden on your heart um, or a, a special prayer request if you would slip up your hand and as you put up your hand God sees it and we're going to pray for whatever that need is. So is there any unspoken requests here? Right through the body of the church. So yes, let's just remember, thinking of Betty's daughter as well, thinking of, of, of Jeanette, that God will draw near. So let's just bow near, bow together, and let's just pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning that we can draw near to a living God. And we thank you that you are the one who has saved our souls from death. Even from that you've dried our tears and you've kept our feet from falling. And Lord, how we can walk before you in the land of the living. Lord, we're very, very thankful um, for all of your blessings and for all of your goodness toward us. And I just pray for everyone that has walked in through the door of our church, through the doors of our church. And I just pray for each one. Um, where there's needs, where there's family issues, where there's cares, you know all about them. Nothing is oblivious to you. And we know that you are more than able to accomplish what concerns us today, to meet every need and to answer every prayer. And so I would just pray for each one. Family members that are going through sickness, we just lift them up before you. Family members that are going through tests, we bring them before you and we ask, Lord, that you would just really hear our prayers and answer today. We do think of the Crosby family circle and we ask that you would comfort them um, as only you can. I know that Robert has loved you all of these years. You've called them home. And even as we think of another verse in that wonderful psalm, Psalm 116, how it says, The precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. And you've called another saint home. But we know that there's family here on this earth who will obviously miss him. And I ask that you would draw near and be their comfort today. And so, Lord, we do pray for, for every need, for every concern, every care. We lift them all up before you. And we ask for your blessing very much um, upon our service today. And for... Lord, even for all of these unspoken requests, those that have lifted their hand just to acknowledge a need that's gone on in their own lives, we ask, Lord, that you would hear and that you would answer. So bless your word this morning. Let this be a blessed time together. And Lord, I do pray in the name of Jesus that a vaccine will be found for this coronavirus. We pray that it will lift, it will be removed, and that lives will get back um, to some kind of normality once again. We thank you that we can even meet in this kind of a fashion today. And I do think of the health minister, I think of the head of the, the health departments, the NHS, and the people that are working on the front line. We don't forget about them. And even the car workers that are getting in and out of homes today. Lord, remember them all and help them and protect them, we pray. And we will be careful. We give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. So we're going to, this is the kids' part. And I know that there's no kids' reach at the minute, but we are working our way toward it, hopefully, at some point. We actually had a youth leaders meeting the other night, which was eventful, Friday night. <laughs> Which was eventful, wasn't it? It was a good night. And um, yeah, we'll keep this posted a poop at as, as time goes on. But does any of the kids want to come up and help us this morning to sing, Lord, I lift your name on high? I can't do a solo here. Any takers? What about Naomi? Is Naomi coming up, Tanya? Okay, okay, no problem. 
What about a layout on our mom layer? Is it going to come up? Because I know that some of the folks that are even watching today, they have commented how they really enjoy watching the kids do their wee part here this morning. So come on, on up and let's sing, Lord, I lift your name on high. And you coming up too, Lucas, are you? Oh, you're doing all right. So. I was actually just testing you there to say, okay. Right, come on. We'll get everybody to stand on their feet and we'll sing, Lord, I lift your name on high. Come on, let's stand together, please. <laughs> John is coming next Sunday. We we'll look forward to him coming, ministering here. And then 1.30 I'll be just speaking uh, because he's going to another uh, meeting in the afternoon and it's too close for the half one service. Um, so we'll be taking Sunday afternoon and John will be speaking to you in the morning. So we really look forward to that because John, John has been really used of God, a wonderful ministry of evangelism. And um, I know that you'll be blessed and even if he comes and shares a bit of his testimony and and how he's got involved in the work of God as well as sharing the word with us. And um, so that will be something really to look forward to uh, next Sunday. So I don't think I've left anything out other than to say again, folks, if you would just follow the one-way system through the door here and out onto the street and talk away to five o'clock if you want. Um, and thank you all for your generosity. Um, through your faithful giving, every bill, every need has been met, every bill has been paid, and we're very, very thankful for your goodness and for your faithful giving. So God bless you, and may your giving hands never cease. All right? Okay? So let's turn to the Word of God this morning, please. And we're going to have a, a reading today from. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and I'm going to start reading at verse 17. Again I really appreciate Gloria for going to uh, taking the time to put the verses on the screen as well as some of the little comments that we'll have on the screen today and so if you haven't got a Bible please follow them, write them down because we believe that uh, what we've put on the screen is even some of the little quotes and comments 
um, will be something for you to ponder and to think about even during the week as we think about our message this morning. So we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and we're going to read from verse 17. <clears throat> I have to say that this is a subject that I've never really preached much about over all of the, the years that we've been preaching. But it's been a message that's been on our hearts because we've been thinking about the subject of worship. And, you know, over the last few weeks, we've been thinking about Mary and Martha, Mary at the feet of Jesus, worshipping, uh, thinking about last week, the alabaster box of ointment that was poured as an act of worship and sacrifice. I want to continue on the theme of worship this morning. So verse 17 starts, now in given these instructions, I do not praise you. Now remember folks that Paul is writing to a church, church at Corinth, just like the way we have made up, we're the church in the Woodsville, the Welcome Church. This is the church at Corinth. Now in given these instructions, I do not praise you since you come together, not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. And in part, I believe it. For there must also be factions among you that those who are approved may be recognized among you or evident or manifest among you. Therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of, of others, and one is hungry and another is drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. That the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, Take eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord, that we may not be condemned with the world. Therefore, my brethren, when ye come together to eat, wait for one another. But if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, lest you come together for judgment, and the rest I will set in order when I come. And we'll just stop there and we'll pray that God will bless his word to all of our hearts. <clears throat> On the subject of worship, <clears throat> here's a thought that came to my mind yesterday. And it's actually well written down. Worship is not an experience. But it's an everyday lifestyle. <clears throat> individually and corporately. The world that we're living in today, people would say, well, we want to go to church to have that worship experience. <laughs> I'm saying to you that it's not an experience. It's a lifestyle. How we live every day. Now thinking corporately. As a church body. And the fact that Paul was writing to a church here. I'm thinking as a church today. One writer commented that 
every part of a church service is an act of worship. Every part. Praying, as we prayed this morning and as you bowed with me and as we prayed one for another, that is an act of worship. You know that, don't you? Well, if you don't, you now do. It's an act of worship. Scripture reading, as we open up God's word, as we follow God's word, that's an act of worship. Singing is an act of worship. Maybe people have thought, well, you know, that's what worship is all about. It's about singing. It's not. It's part of it. It's only part of it. Listening to a sermon, as you're doing now, that's an act of worship. Taking notes as you follow on, it's an act of worship. Giving an offering, it's part of our worship. Folks who desire and go through the waters of baptism by immersion, that's an act of worship. Communion, observing the Lord's table, partaking of the bread and wine, that's an act of worship. And also greeting our fellow worshippers, that is all. And the whole grand scheme, the whole umbrella, that is all part of what worship is. And I want to highlight today, communion is very much right at the heart of worship. In fact, I believe it's right up there, folks, as a time when believers come together to remember what the Lord Jesus went through for us on the cross. It's so important, folks, for believers to come together to remember that sacrifice. But sadly, we see here in this passage that the place of communion was a place where there was divisions among the Corinthian church, among the believers. Very, very evident. Commentators record that the, the early church and when we think of the early church, we're thinking of the church at Corinth, we're thinking of, of the Ephesians, we're thinking of the church at Colossae, um, and right through the New Testament, the letters that Paul wrote, he was writing to churches as we are a church fellowship ourselves today. And commentators record that in the early church that included the Corinthian fellowship, that they actually met together, the church would have met together for a fellowship meal. It was actually known as the love feast. So you can imagine this, the, the scenario here, folks, couldn't you? You know, the people coming together and they have a meal together as a church. But straight after that love feast, that closed with the observance of the Lord's Supper. So they would have came together, they would have had a meal together, and they would have then remembered the Lord's Supper straight afterwards. That's how it was done back in the New Testament. And the people of the church, they were responsible for bringing their own food. There was no outside caterers. We weren't phoning Beth's Bakery and different ones to come in, you know, or, or Naomi to look after things. No, it was people were, you know, you brought your own food with you. Brought your own food. And once you finished that, then you went and everybody together would have remembered the Lord's death, burial, and resurrection. <clears throat> but what was happening here at Corinth, as people brought their own food, here was, here's what was going on. The, the rich of the church, the wealthy of the church, they all sat together. Talk about money attracting, eh? They sat together and they gorged at their own table. While the poor of the church, who maybe didn't have much, they were pushed into some corner of the room. Some ate and some drank excessively, while there was others who sat there hungry. John MacArthur, he describes it this way. He says that the worldly, the fleshly church at Corinth had just turned those sacred meals into gluttonous, drunken <coughs> revelries. Uh, and beyond that, wealthy believers, they brought ample food for themselves, but they just refused to share, letting the poorer Christians leave hungry. Now, if you can just digest what we have described today, 
They weren't only just bringing their own food, they were bringing their own wine, their own drink. And then so, <laughs> you know, this was not a love feast. It was really a feast of self-indulgence, wasn't it? And no wonder Paul was scathing when he heard about this at Corinth and his condemnation of what was going on. He wrote and he says, I do not praise you, since you come together not for the better but for the worse. When you come together as a church, I hear that there's divisions among you, the rich sitting in one corner, the poor in the other. Therefore, when you come together in one place, it's not to eat the Lord's Supper. In other words, what he's saying is that the love feast and the communion celebration had become so perverted that it was a sinful and a selfish mockery. They could not say legitimately that it was all devoted to the Lord since it was not honouring him. And Paul just looked on and he, he wrote and he said, you know what, this is a total sham. This is a joke. You think you're devoted to the Lord while you're divided like this? The poor are sitting in one corner with hardly enough to eat and you rich are sitting there gorging yourselves with food and you are actually getting drunk on the, on the access that you have there? This is a total farce. Then he goes on to say, basically, you are not all together in one heart and in one mind. You're not together. Now that's what happened back at Corinth. In a similar way, I can think of a church not far from here where I learned about two members of one family who hadn't spoken to each other in years. And they sat taking communion every week sitting on opposite sides of the church. <laughs> Could you imagine that? Two believers who profess Jesus as their saviour and yet they're divided and they will partake of the bread and the wine and you know and yet they haven't spoke to each other for years. And the question is this, how can that ever be Christ honouring or Christ exalting? Can't be. And in the same vein, folks, I trust that there's nobody walked in. I know we're not observing the Lord's table here this morning, but if we were, I hope that there's nobody has come in here today and you've fallen out with somebody or you're not talking to somebody and you're even contemplating taking of the bread and wine because I would be saying, don't do that until you get right with your brother or sister. I wouldn't dream of coming in here this morning Knowing in the back of my mind that I've fallen out with somebody or I've hurt somebody, I wouldn't even dare take of the bread and wine until I've spoken to that person first and cleared up that if the apology hasn't been needed to make, then that's what should have been done. So never think of, of doing anything else different. How can it be Christ honouring if we sit with a grudge against another person or we've fallen out with someone and it hasn't been sorted out. It's what we have called in the title of this message today, Not Discerning the Lord's Body. Paul went on to say in verse 21 and verse 22, For in eating, each takes his own supper ahead of others. And one is hungry and another is drunk, as we've just explained. What, do you not have houses to eat and drink in? In other words, Paul is saying, look, if you intend to selfishly indulge, you should have just stayed in the house instead of coming out and being a part of this. Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. Folks, this was shameful conduct. That was a disgrace to the name of the Lord. And the perpetrators quite rightly deserve to be rebuked for such behaviour. Now that's by way of introduction and a little bit of history I suppose as what was happening within the early church even way back then. And that's another lesson folks. Do not read the New Testament and think that everything was fantastic in the New, church, in, in the New Testament church. That everyone was super saints and that there was no issues, there was no problems because there was problems. And you see a problem here that Paul's trying to address. And what I want to do right now, folks, I want to show the contrast between the conduct 
and the real meaning of the Lord's Supper because you know we could be here today and as we prepare to come along on Tuesday night to take of the bread and wine what is it all about what is this observance all about even in worship what is it all about and so Paul in verses 23 to verse 26 he goes right back to the original institution and what he says in those verses for I received from the Lord Jesus that which I delivered to you, that in the night the Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, take eat, this is my body that's broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do, as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. And then Paul adds these words, for as often as you eat this bread, for as often as you do this, you know, some churches will do it once a, once a year. They'll have communion once a year. Some maybe will have communion twice a year. Some will have it once a month. Some churches will have it every week. Some churches maybe have it even at every service. You know, there's actually no formula. It says for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup. He goes on to say, you proclaim, you demonstrate the Lord's death till he comes. And so folks, the whole meaning and the purpose for believers is to remember what the Lord Jesus has done for us on the cross. How that he sacrificed himself. How that he made a way whereby our sins could be forgiven. And the focus of the church body all of us as believers, when we come together to remember him, should always be about him. Our minds, our thoughts should be on him. Not about the roast in the oven. <gasps> It'll leave it on. What temperatures are that? Are we going to go home to Levitical priesthood offerings? Well, that's a, that's a legitimate excuse. <laughs> but you know what I'm trying to say? You know, when we come into church, don't be thinking about work in the morning. Don't be thinking about what we're going to do later on in the day. You know, our whole thoughts should be consumed about him. Thinking about the Lord. Not upon anyone or anything else. I want you to see how Paul mentions that the Lord Jesus, he took the bread. This really gripped my mind when I was thinking about it during the week. How did the Lord took the bread? And the bread represents his body that would be broken on the cross. And how that he took that bread and he gave thanks for it. And then he broke it and he gave it to others who was with him that night when he instituted the Lord's table. And he did the very same with the cup which represents his blood that would be shed in a sacrificial way. And you can't help but look at the actions of the Lord Jesus and contrast what he did with the self-indulgent carnal hearts of the Corinthian believers. And we can see that contrast very clearly. How they met in a selfish way. And here's the Lord Jesus. He's meeting in a selfish way. He's taking it and he's giving it away whereas they were hoping it all for themselves. We can see that contrast today, can't we? And the bread was to remember him and his atoning death for us. And his cup was one of self-denial, ready to be poured out for our sins. And one writer actually says, Jesus allowed himself to be broken and to be poured out. Today he has not called the Christian church to a new religion, but rather to surrender unto his lordship. He wants our lives to be broken and poured out just like the alabaster box of ointment was poured upon him. Didn't we talk about that last week? That the fragrance of Christ would be upon us. Manifesting occur for those around us and also within the fellowship. Is that what verse 26 is all about? For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim, you demonstrate. What are we demonstrating? 
What are we proclaiming? The Lord's death till he comes. We can, we can fail, folks, to understand what the Lord's table is all about. And that was the message Paul was getting across to the Corinthian believers. And to know something, if it just became a ritual, if it just became a going through the motions of taking bread and taking wine, you know, wrapped up in our own world without a care, without a thought for anyone else, then we are not demonstrating the truth and the reality of Christ's death for the sins of the world. You know something, a self-seeking, a self-indulgent, and a non-current attitude to the needs of others around you is not representing the Lord Jesus in the way that he wants to be represented. And that's the point, folks, very, very clearly. That is why Paul mentions that if believers come together lightly or if they come together ir ir irrelevant or ir ir irreverently, then we are in danger of rebuke. And the time to examine our hearts and our lives is before we leave our homes and we come here to join with the rest of the church body. And that's why I'm, I'm saying again, like I said at the, at the very beginning, and you know, this may come across as a very heavy message, but I want you to think about this because, you know, these are things that we really need to be thinking through. Wouldn't you agree? We need to be thinking through these messages, why we do things, why we come together, why that we would come on any given Sunday in a normal time and there would be a table spread here with bread and wine and believers would stay and believers would partake. And we would do that week after week after week after week. And I wonder, you know, as we do that week after week after week, we can easily fall into a kind of a habit. That this becomes a habit, that this becomes something that we do because it's what believers do while we're here without really understanding the reasons why we do it. And the time we examine our hearts and our lives is before we leave our homes, when we come together to join the rest of the church body and listen, if we need to come in and we need to offer an apology, then that's what we need to do. Or if restoration or if restitution needs to be made or if sin needs to be confessed to God, then that is what needs to happen. Paul goes on to say in verse 28 and verse 29, but let a man examine himself. And so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Every time I think of that verse, I always think about an old friend of mine, first job I ever worked in. And, um, and I remember working with two Christian businessmen were involved. And I'll tell you, uh, one of my dear friends, he became an evangelist. And... Um, and was mightily used of God. Ivan Thompson was a wonderful friend and a wonderful, maybe some of the folks that are listening on today as well as some of the, the folks that are here today will remember Ivan. And as we worked together, I remember one of the bosses boasting one morning, and that's the only way I could put it. He actually boasted and he said, you know something, I haven't missed a break in a bread service for 25 years. And I even just looked at him and said, well, maybe you should have thought about maybe doing so. But the Bible says, let a man examine himself. <laughs> and every time I think of that, I always think of him. Let a man examine himself. Let him eat of that bread. Let him drink of that cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy. Do you know that word unworthy means ritualistic? If we eat and drink in a ritualistic if it becomes a ritual of just doing it manner um, an unrepentant manner and a bitter manner he eats and drinks judgment to himself not discerning the Lord's body Dr. David Jeremiah says to come to the table in an unworthy manner really means to come in a carnal um, with an ungodly spirit or division or disunity. Christians should first examine themselves, not to beat themselves up over personal sin, 
Because remember, folks, we are only sinners saved by God's grace, who are being kept by God's power, not to beat themselves up, but to determine if they're holding something against a fellow believer that could cause disunity in the body. Let me just ask a simple question. If we were having communion this morning, and you were going to come and partake, would you be coming to the table with something in your heart against somebody else? Would you do that? Would you dare to do that? And you say, well, the Lord understands. Well, Lord, yeah. Yeah, they understand. You need to sort that out before you would even do it, before you even think about it. Maybe when we come together on Tuesday night, you know, you want to keep these things in mind, folks. Because this is part of our worship. All of the stuff that we have mentioned today, this is what a worship service is all about. And here's what I want to do. I want to draw you a close. The next time that you and I come to break bread together, there's two questions that I want you to ask yourself before you would put a bit of bread in your mouth or before you would even take up the cup. There's two questions that you need to ask yourself before you would even do that. Here's the first one. Ask yourself, as I've asked myself, before I take this bread and before I take this wine and when I think of Jesus, how he broke that bread and how he gave it out in a selfless way, here's the question. Do I have a genuine care for others? That's the first question. Have I a genuine care for others? Those that are in the body and those that are outside of the body. Do we care for people that are outside of us? Do we care for those that are outside of the kingdom? Have we a genuine care for the souls of others? Could you imagine the Lord Jesus as he passed that bread? And he looked at some of the faces of those disciples. Well, there was one of them who would actually deny that he ever even knew him. Peter was sitting there. And he handed the bread to him. I think he handed the cup to him. And yet he was the very one that would stand there on the far side that would curse and swear and say, I never even knew him. And then the cock would crow and he would remember what he had done. The Lord didn't exclude him, did he? He didn't exclude the other disciples because we're told in the Lord's hour of need, they all forsook him and fled. They all run. You know, it's like the old Ulsterism, isn't it? You know, last band standing, first rap running. They all run. But he knew, because he knew what lay ahead of him. He knew all about the cross. He knew the suffering. You know, even at Gethsemane where he wanted that inner group around him. And he said, can you not even watch with me for one hour? He knew. Even those people. And yet he was willing, in a selfless way, to give to them. <clears throat> And we need to think about that, folks, regarding our attitude to those that are outside. How we think about people that are outside. And we need to ask, is this a Christ-like spirit? Is this how Christ would think about people? Are we representing Christ the way that he wants to be represented? That's the first question. Before we would again take bread and wine, that's the first question. When I come on Tuesday night, that's the first question I'll be asking myself. Before I leave the house, I really are, have I real care for the people that are here and the people that are outside? And here's the second question. Am I willing to let my life be poured out as an offering of worship to the servant king in service to others? Am I willing to do that? Am I willing to give of myself to serve others? In any way that we can. And that's the question as believers. That we should be asking ourselves. Is it just about us four and no more? Is it about what happens within our own house? And we just close the door. Forget about everybody else. And we just pray for our own. And that's it. Or have we that heart of a servant. That wants to serve others. 
think about those two questions. And as I've thought about it, certainly when we come together on Tuesday night, because this has changed my whole thinking and what it means to come together before we take some bread and before we take some wine. What communion is all about as an act of worship. And I want you to think about the example of our Saviour as we close. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. And here's the good news, folks. He is coming again. Amen. He is coming. The fact that one in every 25 verses in the New Testament points to the second coming of Christ tells us and reminds us that the Lord is coming again. 318 times in the New Testament. Read through the New Testament. Mark those verses and have a look at it. The Lord Jesus is coming again. And we need to be ready. And we need to be prepared. As a bride, there's a common web. There's a day when the Lord is going to come for the church and he's going to rapture us and we're going to be with him. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. But what he did say in Matthew 24, yes, it's great to know that the Lord is coming, but he's told us to occupy until he comes to serve. And let's live our lives according to what the Bible is teaching us. Let's live our lives you know, in the principles of what we have learned this morning, even in just one aspect of communion, let God's word speak to all of our hearts this day. For Jesus' sake. Let's pray. <clears throat> just while we're in an attitude of prayer, I just want to speak to the church. I want to speak to believers today. And I want to ask the question, how is your heart toward others? Is it a servant heart? How is your heart towards the needs of others? Look at the example of our Saviour, who gave willingly his own life, laid down his life, that we would know him in a personal way. And when he walked this earth, he didn't come to be ministered on to, but to minister. And to give his life as a ransom for many. And thank God that we're in the many today. So just examine your own heart right now. Just before we leave. How's our own hearts today toward others? towards people and do we have that servant heart again if there's a person here that's not saved and as you've listened on I know that I've addressed the church I've addressed believers but if you're still out of the fellowship then I just pray that you will make that step and put your faith and trust in the Lord or if you're a backslider that you will just find your way home again Or the believer that needs to be revived in spirit. Well may you be revived today. Heavenly Father we thank you for your word. And we thank you for the, the, the ability that is ours to be able to worship you. In spirit and in truth. And as we have looked at this one aspect of what worship is. I really pray that you will speak to our hearts. Lord, speak to us, minister to us, bring up their minds what it is to partake, what it really means to observe. Taking of the bread and wine, thinking of your example as you gave yourself for others. Oh God, help us to really speak into our own hearts as we worship you, the servant king. Hear us today, we pray, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Can we stand together?
and sing the servant king. This is our God, the servant king. Let's worship him as we leave. God bless you. Have a really good week. And uh, I just pray that you'll be really blessed in your own heart. Let's sing to the Lord. Jesus comes, recall.